Hello once again. This is the third lecture in the Israel and Prophecy series, part one. And what we'll do is we'll pick up where we left off. In this, this particular lecture, what we'll do is we will take some time, we'll go back and uh, just touch base with some of the passages that we dealt with at the end of the last lecture in Genesis 25th chapter. Uh, relevant to the, the transfer or the passing on of specifically the birthright, but also uh, the, uh, the blessings relevant to the Abrahamic uh, promises. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Genesis 27, Genesis 28, and see how in succession uh, these records uh, confirm and show us how uh, the promises to Abraham were passed on from Abraham to Isaac and, and then ultimately to Jacob. Um, then we'll move on and take a look at how those promises were passed on from the patriarch uh, Jacob to Ephraim and Manasseh. And then we'll backtrack just a moment or two to wrap the, uh, the lecture session up for today, uh, talking a bit about uh, specifically the shifting of the promises, the blessings, the birthright in particular, uh, from the first of Jacob's firstborn sons, Reuben, uh, into the second, or the hands of the second of his uh, firstborn uh, son, uh, namely uh, the, uh, the figure of Joseph. We finished last time talking a bit about Genesis 25, and if you'll take your Bible out and go to that section, <clears throat> while you're doing that, I also might mention in your workbook, last time in terms of the, uh, the questions uh, completed, we covered the first five of those, or information in the last lecture, and then today we will cover information that will uh, provide you with what you need to answer questions six and seven as you move along through uh, completing those assignments and responsibilities. Um, meanwhile, back in Genesis 25, we ended last time, as I said, with the story of Esau selling his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup to his brother. It reminds me of uh, my son and I were talking about this this summer. He was He's eight years old, and uh, uh, we read through the story, and he listened uh, with dutiful respect and great care. We came to the part about where uh, Esau said he was about to die, and he was willing to uh, to trade the birthright and the blessings that went with that for, for this bowl of soup. And uh, I finished the story and looked, and he thought, pensive for a moment or two, and he turned and looked at me and said, Dad, why didn't he just make his own soup? Well, maybe a good question. Uh, he didn't. And the rest uh, is a, one of those great transition stories in history. Uh, it finishes up where, in verse 34, chapter 25, Jacob gave Esau the bread and the pottage of lentils. Esau ate, he drank, he rose up, he went his way. And as a result of that, it says, Esau despised his birthright. Now, if that were not enough, let's go over to chapter 27, because you have one of the grand examples of collusion, in this case between a mother and a son, to make sure that that blessing or the blessing entailed in the birthright, uh, what ultimately uh, for Joseph would amount to a double portion of the inheritance. There was collusion between mother and son in terms of making sure the father confirmed that promise. Um, this raises all kinds of, of uh, issues, uh, one of the, the most important of which uh, is, uh, you know, to what degree does God become involved? in our lives. What does God allow? What does God permit? When does God intervene? So on and so forth. Uh, the story of Jacob is a story that has its negative uh, seamy side, to be sure. It's a story where you have a young man who, uh, acting uh, at the encouragement of a parent, who, acting in his own self-interest, goes ahead and does certain things that he simply should not do. God allowed that. God let it be that way. Should it have been? No, it should not. But there are times when God will allow things to unfold in those ways, uh, but ultimately in the long run he'll guarantee the outcome, whatever the outcome is that God intends it should be. Um, if, if Jacob had waited, if he had uh, allowed God to work it out in God's own good due time, indeed uh, Jacob would have eventually received the blessings uh, that came along with the birthright through the Abrahamic promise. Uh, he chose not to do that, even as we sometimes choose not to do those kinds of things. Even, in fact, as his grandfather chose to try to work things out on his own uh, in the way that the human society, culture, uh, the people of, of the ancient world in that day and age tried to work things out. Uh, in the long run, 
the lesson being God can get us where he wants us to be regardless of uh, however we may uh, get there uh, through whatever means and in spite frankly of, of the wrong ways that sometimes we uh, we use or employ in trying to get from point A to point B to acquire the blessings that God wants uh, to put upon our heads. If you'll turn over to Genesis 28, this is the second episode in a sense of the, uh, uh, the, the confirmation in the biblical record that Jacob was to receive that promise, uh, those promises that came along with the, uh, the blessing our blessings and uh, covenant uh, to, to Abraham. Uh, Genesis 28, beginning in, uh, let's begin in verse 1. Isaac called Jacob, uh, charged and blessed him, uh, said to him to take not, I'm sorry, let me go back for just a moment. I'm a chapter ahead. Let's go back to chapter 27, I'm getting a little ahead of the game. Uh, Rebecca heard, let's go to uh, Genesis 20, 27 and verse 5. Uh, Rebecca heard when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. Uh, now, uh, Isaac had told Esau to go into the field uh, to kill a deer, to bring it back, to cook it in just the way, the special way that Isaac enjoyed the meat to be prepared. And then Isaac was going to confer the blessing uh, on, on his head. Uh, Rebecca overheard these things. In verse 6 we find Rebecca spoken to Jacob, her son, saying, Listen, I heard what your father said. Uh, he said these things un unto uh, your brother Esau. Bring me venison, make me a, a tasty meal that I may eat and bless you before the eternal, before my death. And here is where the deceit begins. Uh, now therefore, Rebekah says, my son, obey my voice according to which I command you. Go to the flock, fetch me from, from the flock uh, two good kids of the goats, and I will make that savory meat. In essence, she was setting up her husband uh, in order to uh, see that the, the, the major portion of the birthright blessings and promises devolved on the head uh, of Isaac, uh, uh, pardon me, of uh, Jacob. And Jacob followed his mother's instructions. And if you'll turn over to chapter 26, let's just look there for a moment. And the story, of course, is well known. Uh, um, Rebecca dressed her son uh, Jacob up and the appropriate clothing so he would have a certain smell, even took uh, goat skins and put them on his arms so that when the father Isaac put his hands on those arms, it would have the texture and the feel of Esau. As one of my friends in the ministry once said, Esau would have been a, a really good person to do a, a Schick razor commercial, commercial if he could uh, have been mistaken for uh, having that kind of hair on his arms. Um, certainly uh, uh, quite, quite abnormal, but it worked. Apparently, uh, uh, Isaac's uh, senses were not sharp enough at that stage and age in his life. Uh, and even though he was somewhat skeptical at first, he eventually became convinced, and he passed that blessing on. Let's read, uh, again, within the, the point of this being to see that the blessing was passed on from Isaac to Jacob. Verse 26, we'll pick up the thread of the story. And Jacob's father, uh, Isaac, said unto him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and he kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his clothing. He blessed him and he said, See the smell of my sons, the smell of the field, which the eternal God is blessed. Therefore, and here the blessing is defined, God give you the dew of the heaven, implying living in an environment, a setting where the, the weather conditions will be good, which will allow for the ag kind of agricultural prosperity that makes for national greatness. Uh, and give the fatness of the earth, the earth's produce, uh, the pl and plenty of corn and wine. In verse 29, and let people serve you. Let the nations bow down to you. Be you Lord over your brothers, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. So there you see the father, Isaac, the recipient of the promises from his father Abraham now, is beginning to pass this on down the line, not to Esau, the firstborn. And you'll see this in the succession of the passing on of promises. You'll see it in, uh, in many instances throughout the record of biblical history and genealogies, where there will be an instance where the, the older son will not receive uh, perhaps what he's entitled by right of primogeniture, the fact that he is the firstborn, uh, getting a double portion 
as it often was done in, in times of antiquity, of the inheritance. Uh, it will skip the firstborn and go then to someone else lower in the birth order. King David would be a classic example of that, uh, being eighth in sequence in terms of his own family. Uh, the, uh, the account that we read about over in uh, the book of 1 Samuel uh, talks a good bit about that and is one of many examples that we could cite along that line. Now let's turn to uh, Genesis chapter 28. This is the passage that I started to begin with prematurely just a moment ago. What did God think about all of this? Well, I can't imagine that God would have uh, countenanced or condoned the deceitful method that was used. But in his broader plan, this was the way in which he wanted things to go. It was through the line of Jacob that he intended that these blessings, the Abrahamic promise, the covenant, and so on, uh, be passed. And as we read in chapter 28 of the book of Genesis, what we're going to find here is that God himself confirms that, yes, this is the direction he wants uh, the passing on of those uh, covenant uh, promises uh, to go. Verse 1 of chapter 28, Isaac called Jacob, he blessed him, charged him, to, uh, and said unto him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise and go to Paden Aram. And that, of course, is what, uh, what we find uh, Jacob doing. Verse 3, God Almighty bless you, uh, Isaac says to Jacob, make you fruitful, multiply you, that you may be a multitude of people, and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your seed with you, that you may inherit the land wherein you are a stranger, which the, which the eternal God gave to Abraham. Then let's drop down to verse 10, because we read, then Jacob went out from Beersheba, and he went toward Haran, going back to the old homeland. He's going to find a wife from among the people uh, that his, his uh, grandfather Abraham came. Uh, verse 11, he lighted on a certain place along the way on his journey. He tarried there all night because the sun was set, and he took the stone, stones of that place, and he put them for his pillow, and he lay down in that place to sleep. And it was at this juncture that God gave to Jacob a dream which is going to confirm and give a godly imprimatur to assure Jacob that the blessings which he has secured through not so honorable means indeed are the things which God will confer upon and given to him and his descendants. Verse 12, Jacob dreamed and behold a ladder set on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heaven, and behold, angels of God ascending and descending on it. And then verse 13, we find, Behold, the Eternal stood above, and he said, I am the Eternal God of Abraham, your, uh, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land wherein you lie, to you I am going to give that land to you and your seed. And once again, notice the physical nature and emphasis of the promise. It has to do with national material greatness and blessings. It has to do uh, with land, which is repeated again and again and again, as we have already seen uh, in looking at the restatements passing on from one generation to the next of these promises. Verse 14, and your seed, once again, dealing with physical, material, national uh, aspects. Your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, a metaphor. We'll come back at a later lecture and talk a bit about how uh, this promise was fulfilled successively and in numerous ways at different times through history. The ultimate fulfillment, uh, of course, uh, waiting yet uh, to, to be received uh, in a millennial context within the confines of the rule of Jesus Christ on earth. Um, but the promise is that the seed will be blessed, it will be numerous as the dust of the earth, and you're going to spread abroad. Where, where will Jacob's descendants go? Uh, and this promise, once again, applies to the territory of the land of Canaan, but it expands outward <coughs> as well, even as we'll see the story of the, especially the, the British, but also to some extent the American people uh, will apply as well. Uh, you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And then the, the spiritual, the, the prime, dimension to the promise, uh, which is of greatest significance, is added on here at the end. And in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So there's a twofold dimension to that promise. And God confirms the blessings as they are passed on now from Isaac uh, to Jacob. 
If you'll turn to chapter 35, and various ministers in the Church, church of God over the years have looked at this example uh, and uh, questioned and wondered uh, about its meaning, and I rather think that, that probably Mr. Armstrong uh, was on to something when he took the example in Genesis 35 of Jacob and said there was a process, an ongoing process, and we see only at this juncture that you really find the patriarch Jacob reaching what we might in Christian terms uh, consider the conversion process or the moment at which he turned and rounded the corner. It is the moment at which, in fact, uh, God changed his name from Jacob, uh, which means supplanter, which was a, a, a very accurate term uh, to name him in terms of what he had done in acquiring the birthright blessing and promises. Uh, now his name is going to be changed to Israel, or one who prevails with God. Chapter 35 is the setting, it's the context for the story of Jacob wrestling all night long with the angel of the eternal and not letting go in spite of the fact that he was severely injured and perhaps even made lame for uh, the, the remainder of his life because of that injury where his hip was dislocated or taken out of joint. Uh, whatever the case may be in that regard, we read in chapter um, 35, beginning in verse 9, God appeared to Jacob again when he came out of Paden Aram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called, though, any more Jacob, but rather Israel shall be your name. And he called his name Israel. Uh, verse 11 begins to uh, reemphasize and state again some of these elements uh, of the promise. Note carefully what verse 11 has to say, because it is here that we see for the first time in Scripture, something that's again repeated a little later, Jacob himself will be the speaker the next time we see these phrases, but it provides for us a key in terms of the location and in terms, in fact, uh, even of the history of the people, uh, the descendants of Jacob, as they begin to receive and inherit these blessings and promises that are guaranteed as part of the Abrahamic covenant in terms of its physical, national, material dimensions. Verse 11, God said unto Jacob, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come out of you, and king, kings shall come out of your loins. So this promise of a nation and a company of nations becomes very prominent, and it will figure in, and as we explore uh, the, the nature of God's blessing to the descendants of Abraham, that's going to be one of the key factors in helping us identify or locate the descendants of uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, specifically the descendants of Joseph in modern times and modern history. Uh, verse 12, the thought is completed or rounded out, and the land, physical, national, material blessings, which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to you I will give it, and to your seed after you I will give this land. Now in the sequence of passing along uh, the, the covenantal promises, let's go then to Genesis the 48th chapter. This is one of the most important passages in Scripture, <coughs> along with Genesis 49. You begin to see kind of the blueprint or the mapping out of, of those promises that are going to overtake at, at various stages uh, in, in almost like successive waves uh, of fulfillment, uh, the descendants of, of Israel. Chapter 48, the first 22 verses, well actually the entire chapter, uh, gives us a very important prophecy, uh, a prophecy which um, predicts the eventual growing large of the descendants of, of in specific, the, the sons of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh, of their expansion into a, a, a large people and eventually their separation from one another into two distinct national political entities. Now we'll look at those uh, verses which promise that and which echo what we've just read over in uh, Genesis 35 momentarily. Um, in Genesis 48, beginning in verse 1, then, uh, the patriarch Jacob is nearing the end of his life. He realizes his time on earth is almost past, and he wants to bring before him these two sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, sons that were born as a result of a union between Joseph uh, and a marriage that he had into the, the, uh, the aristocracy of the, uh, the Egyptian kingdom. Uh, 
Um, in verse 1 we read, And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, your father is sick. It was his time in life. Death was drawing near. Uh, so Joseph took with him his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And one told jo J Jacob uh, and said, Behold, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself. In your mind's eye, perhaps you like I can see, the aged patriarch pushing himself with, with great difficulty up and maybe pivoting and sitting on the edge of his, his bed as some of the, uh, the ar artistic uh, reproductions uh, you know, that, that have uh, immortalized uh, this scene uh, portray for us. He strengthens himself and sits up in verse 2 on his bed. And Jacob then says unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me. We read some of those accounts uh, already uh, earlier today. And he said unto me, Behold, I will make you fruitful, and I will multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people, and I will give this land to your seed for an everla uh, after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born uh, unto you in the land of Egypt before I came unto you uh, in, in Egypt, these are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Let's pause for a moment and just uh, explore that uh, and, and examine the meaning. What, in essence, you see being done here? Well, we'll look at First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 through 2 in a moment, and you'll see uh, a, an amplification of what, in essence, is being said here. Reuben and Simeon were the two firstborns through Jacob's union or marriage with Leah. They, by rights, would have been the ones to whom, well, Reuben, the right of primogeniture, would have guaranteed to him the double portion of the birthright. Simeon would have been next in line behind him. And what, in essence, is being said here by Jacob is that the sons of Jacob's second firstborn, the result of his union with his favored but second wife, Rachel, uh, Joseph, that first offspring of two, that Joseph's sons will now take the place of Reuben and Simeon uh, from the union between Jacob and, uh, and Leah. Um, he, in essence, is going to transfer, if you want to look at it that way, uh, the, the right of primogeniture at this juncture and at this point. Now, in addition to this, there, there are other important and interesting aspects. And if you'll drop down, um, Jacob, beginning in verse 6, recites the story of his various experiences. And he talks about um, uh, the various things that have happened in his life uh, and how now the, the blessings uh, are going to be passed on uh, to, to Ephraim and Manasseh. In verse 16, he says, The angel which redeemed me from all evil bless these lads, and let my name be named upon them. Why is this statement made? Well, it's made for several reasons, but one reason goes back to the fact that Joseph, who had been cast out of the family by his brothers, who for a period of 22 years was separated from his brethren, his family members, his father, uh, presumed dead by, J by Jacob the father, and uh, perhaps even assumed dead by, uh, by the brothers that, that were left behind as well. Um, this Joseph went, according to God's plan, to Egypt. He spent over two decades uh, experiencing ups and downs, and ultimately wound up in, in the chief seat uh, in political life. Uh, in the kingdom of Egypt, perhaps the most powerful nation or kingdom in that day and age in the entire world. Uh, Jacob, from that position, uh, became, in essence, the prime minister, working underneath the Pharaoh, uh, discharging royal business and duties and, and what have you, uh, ultimately building a family of his own. And when, when it came time for that inheritance to be passed, Jacob didn't want any question whatsoever uh, uh, once he was gone from the scene as to whether or not Joseph's offspring were the legitimate heirs to the inheritance, to the birthright blessings and the promises. And that is at least one specific reason that he lays hands on him, on those two boys in this account. And as it says here, 
has his name placed upon their heads uh, so that if after Jacob was gone from the scene, any of those other 11 brothers would raise question or objection, would make the charge of, well, Joseph's sons certainly cannot inherit the promises of the covenant because they are half-breeds. They are part Egyptian uh, and, and part from the lineage that comes off of our family, family line. Uh, Jacob, by naming his name upon them, um, gives his stamp of approval, we could put it perhaps that way, uh, on, on those two uh, young boys being the legitimate heirs to the promise and specific to the, the physical national uh, blessings tied in to the promise that are going to go in the direction of Joseph's descendants. Uh, of course, another dimension to this, which is also a very important one, is that in prophecy, not in every instance, but in many instances, when the name then of Jacob or Israel is used, uh, it for end time prophecies or prophecies relevant to the end of the age, it certainly seems to imply or indicate that many of those prophecies are going to be specifically targeted for the descendants uh, of, of Joseph as opposed to or distinct from uh, those descendants of the other uh, tribes that, that come out of uh, the family of Jacob. It goes on to say, let my name then be named upon them in verse 16, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when you look through the uh, uh, perspective that we've sketched and examined over the years in the tradition of the Church of God, that the, uh, the Israelitish people today are to be found uh, specifically uh, among the Northwestern European uh, peoples, uh, but the descendants in particular of Joseph are in the British Isles, the, the Commonwealth nations, and the United States of America. That's precisely what happened. You have people moving into that Northwestern region of Europe, growing as it were into a multitude, and not until later in their history, not until we get really into the late 18th century, do you have what is predicted, if you'll drop down now to verse 19, uh, echoing the language of the promise that we saw uh, earlier in the, the prophecy of Genesis 30, 35. Um, we find that uh, Joseph brings the lads, well let's actually begin this, get a running start in verse 17. Joseph saw his father had laid his right hand, the right hand connoting a greater blessing than the left, he had laid his right hand on the head of the younger son, Ephraim, okay, crossing his arms like so. Okay. Uh, when Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. That wasn't the way it was supposed to be. And he held his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head and put it on Manasseh's head. He wanted to reverse it. He felt that his father was old, uh, infirmed. Uh, his senses were not sharp, they weren't what they used to be, and, and Joseph was going to correct what he perceived as his father's mistake. Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn, meaning Manasseh. Put your right hand upon his head. Then the knowing Jacob looked, and it says in verse 19, His father refused, and he said, I know it, my son, I know. Um, he also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. And indeed, the descendants of Manasseh have become, they constitute today, the greatest um, um, single nation in the history, at least that's recorded, of the world. Um, he also then shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. And we'll talk about in, in later lectures, in part two of this lecture series, we'll talk about the distinction between the United States uh, and the British Commonwealth, and why, at least in my opinion, uh, the, the traditional identification of Ephraim with the British people and the Commonwealth nations uh, is correct. The identification with Manasseh and the United States is likewise correct. Truly, Verse 19, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude, a company of, a community of nations. Um, and as I say, part two, we'll explore in some uh, little depth uh, the, the whole issue of what a multitude of nations comprises and constitutes.
Now, if you will, turn over to uh, one of the most interesting passages in all of Scripture relevant to this. If you look in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, the first two verses um, provide some of the most important information relevant to the discussion of uh, Israel and prophecy in all the Bible. Uh, this particular passage, uh, there are many of you who are quite familiar with the writings of Mr. Armstrong and the fact that Mr. Armstrong's acquaintance with the idea of the identity of Israel in modern times goes back and is very greatly indebted to the writings of one Methodist minister, uh, a man who lived in the Pacific Northwest at least for a period of time during his career. His name was John Harden Allen and the old community of British Israelite writers. Uh, Allen was, was one of the major figures and even today still his works are some of the most balanced, carefully researched, and fairly and even handedly presented material that you can find. If you look in your workbook, just flip there. Now, uh, the bibliography is, or is alphabetically arranged uh, and you'll find a couple of works among many that, that Allen did uh, that, that even today bear, uh, uh, well, they're worthwhile, they're, they're uh, worth taking a look at. But the first of these, a book called Joda, or pardon me, Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright, uh, was the volume that Mr. Armstrong became acquainted with and in many ways largely modeled his own writings and works upon. Allen got the title for that particular book from this passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 5. Uh, let's take a look at it because there are two aspects of the Abrahamic promise that are delineated here. And we see that when you get to the point where you're dealing with the, what would it be, the great grandchildren of the, the patriarch Abraham, there is in essence a separation and the physical, national, material dimensions of the promise will go with one of the descendants of Abraham, specifically Joseph. While the scepter promise, or the promise of rulership, uh, to one degree political rulership in Israel, but much more importantly, the promise of the coming of Messiah and spiritual salvation, that part of the promise will be fulfilled through a different line and a different son. Judah, uh, the fourth born among uh, the, uh, the children of Jacob, produced off the line of Leah. Now in 1 Chronicles 5, it reads, Now the sons of Reuben were the firstborn of Israel. And here the narrator inserts a parenthetical thought in the midst of the biblical text. And it's a critical one because in essence what he is doing is telling us something went wrong. The, the succession uh, of, of the, the promise that was given which ordinarily would have gone from father to the firstborn male offspring. We're going to depart from that, and there's a good reason for it. We'll explore that here momentarily. Uh, the sons of Reuben were the firstborn of Israel, parentheses, for he was the firstborn. But forasmuch as he, and here's the problem, he defiled his father's bed. Now let's go back. If you have a um, marginal reference, you may see in the margin uh, that you can go back to Genesis 35. Let's just turn there in verse 22. Genesis 35 and verse 22. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Billah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. So what you have here is a relationship between Reuben and his stepmother, one of the four wives uh, of, uh, actually, uh, Bella was one of the two secondary wives, the handmaidens that were given along with Leah and Rachel uh, whenever the marriage to Jacob of those two women took place. Uh, Jacob actually produced offspring of children through those handmaidens as well uh, as, as his legitimate, uh, rightful, uh, lawful wives. But Reuben succumbed to the temptation, uh, a sexual failing, or frailty, and as it says here in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1, he defiled his father's bed. Um, as a result of that, Reuben forfeited the blessings that should have been rightfully his. One other scripture to amplify. Let's go to Genesis 49. 
because there is a reference or an allusion once again, which interestingly enough gives certain clues to help us identify the location, the national um, character, not in every instance to be sure, but in many ways some of the characteristics and traits that we find among the people of Reuben through time. As Reuben grew from, uh, well, went from being an individual uh, to becoming a family and grew large into literally a national people. Verse 4 of Genesis chapter 49. Uh, in Genesis 49, as you probably well know, we have a prophecy or a prediction. Verse 1 of the chapter even says, Jacob called together his children. This is after we read the story of the passing on of the, the blessing uh, of, of Jacob to the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, evidently, shortly thereafter, as it says in verse 1, he called together his sons and said, Gather yourselves together. Why? that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So if we are seeking the descendants of Israel, we can look at some of these various prophecies and it lists or it itemizes all of the 12 sons of Israel and it gives traits, qualities, characteristics which will help us uh, to be able to find them uh, to one degree or another in, in the end times. Uh, one of those predictions regarding Reuben in verse 4. Reuben is un, as unstable as water. You shall not excel. Why? Because you went up to your father's bed and then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. And as a result of this, uh, this sexual sin, we find that Reuben is passed over. And the birthright, as we'll see here in a moment in First Chronicles chapter 5, is conferred then upon Joseph. Interestingly enough, Joseph, that young man who in his late teens or early 20s had the strength of character in contrast to his brother Reuben to resist the opportunities, the temptation, in this case of no less than Potiphar's wife, the man for whom he worked, uh, the man who he essentially served as chief of staff, managing his household affairs, the man, the young man who was uh, physically attractive and appealing to his boss's wife uh, and when she approached him and appealed to him uh, to, to lay with her, he resisted that temptation and as a result wound up going to prison at least for a period of time because of it. Um, the contrast is an interesting one and it's, it is significant that, that Joseph was the one that receives these birthright blessings. Uh, uh, God, in essence, uh, conferring them upon him because of the strength of character that he had in contrast to his brother Reuben. Um, moving back then to verse 1. Um, For as much as Reuben defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given then unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. For the genealogy is not to be reckoned then after the birthright or by right of primogeniture. It's not going to pass the way you would expect for it to pass. And indeed, th this is a pattern that's fairly consistent as you look through the generations of Abraham. Abraham had a son named Ishmael. Ishmael was older than Isaac. The promise went around or over Ishmael and it went on to, to the legitimate offspring through Sarah. Uh, the, uh, the wife of Abraham, that son specifically being named Isaac. Isaac and Rebekah had two children, two sons, twins. Esau being the firstborn, uh, Jacob being the secondborn. Um, the, the birthright through the circumstances that we've already looked at at the end of the last lecture and through a large part of the lecture here today, that birthright went over Esau and was passed on uh, to Jacob. And then again you see that pattern once more replicated in the story of, of the sons of, of uh, Jacob. Joseph, a son who came through Rachel, um, the second of Jacob's wives, uh, that, that son received the birthright as opposed to over and against uh, Reuben who was the firstborn of, of the sons of, uh, of Jacob through the wife Leah. Now, verse 2 goes on to elaborate, and this is one of those uh, important passages in Scripture in examining this issue, because it does show that they're, in essence, at this juncture in the history of, of the descendants of Abraham, the, the right uh, or the, the spiritual uh, dimension of the promise is going to go in one direction through a different part of the family line. Uh, the material 
blessings, the birthright blessings, the national material greatness that will overtake the descendants uh, of, of Abraham is going to go through yet a different line. Verse 2, and this is uh, the, the passage from which John Harden Allen derived the title of his book, Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. It says, For Judah prevailed over or above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. Now let's pause for just a moment and go back to Genesis 49. Keep a finger in 1 Chronicles 5 because we see an earlier statement of this concept in verse 10 of Genesis chapter 49. The, the prophecies for all the children of Israel uh, as they would be fulfilled at, in the latter days as it says in verse 1 of Genesis 49. Verse 10, we read, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, for the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and unto him shall, be, uh, shall the gathering of the people be. Uh, and even in a political sense, we find that the promises uh, of, of physical rulership, is, they will not go specifically through the, the lineage of Joseph, but rather they will go through uh, the Davidic monarchy once it is established. And then out of that same lineage will ultimately come Messiah, Jesus Christ, who will uh, um, provide the avenue for the fulfillment of the greater of the Abrahamic promises, uh, specifically the promise of salvation and eternal life. <clears throat> Again in verse 2 of 1 Chronicles chapter 5, um, of him, of Judah, came the chief ruler. But, completing that parenthetical thought, which begins back in verse 1, but the birthright... The birthright was Joseph's. <clears throat> what then did that birthright entail? <clears throat> we'll spend the, the next 10 or 12 minutes taking a look. Uh, we'll go, let's go back to Genesis 49, uh, that critical and beautiful chapter uh, which really perform, uh, provides for us uh, a centerpiece of sorts, uh, an, an anchor point. Uh, for, for those who would look into the issue of Israel and prophecy and especially what, what the conditions for Israel will be as we move into the, the latter days. <clears throat> now Genesis 49, uh, in, in birth order, we, we find the predictions. Uh, we've already read verse 1. Beginning in verse 3, we read the prophecies relevant to Reuben. Uh, verse 5 talks about the prophecies relevant to Simeon and Levi. Then in verse 8, we begin reading the prophecies respecting Judah. Uh, verse 13, Zebulun. Verse 14, Issachar. Verse 16, Dan. Verse 19, Gad. Verse 20, Asher. And verse 21, Naphtali. Finally, in verse 22, we have an extended prophecy. Remember the birthright blessing, the double portion, as we read in other places, of the birthright is going to be passed on to Joseph. He will get more. All the children of Israel, as is very evidently the case in the peoples that have been broadcast across the northwestern regions of, of the European continent, all of those nations in modern times from the 18th and on through and into the, uh, toward the end of the 20th century, uh, those nations have materially prospered far more than most other peoples around the world. Recent world history has principally been their story. But among that group of people, the Anglo-American peoples have prospered far more than any of the rest. Uh, they have definitely dominated to the place and to the point that it was, uh, what, an expression of speech. And even historians who write without the perspective of the theological point of view that we're introducing here in this class. Historians today write in terms of, well, they describe the 19th century as being the British century. Uh, Pax Britannica was a name that was attached with that age in history, even on into the early 20th century. Uh, once again, you have uh, the historians describing oftentimes the 20th century as the American century. In some cases, you find people who talk in terms of Pax Americana. Um, let's take a look then at these predictions or these prophecies as we bring closure to the lecture today about Joseph, who is described in verse 22 as a fruitful bough, like the limb of a tree that 
that bows down, that hangs heavy with the weight of its produce, uh, where there is not only enough to go around, but in excess in terms of production. And indeed, Joseph uh, in its national form in modern times, not that Joseph's descendants have always distributed things equitably within their own society. They've not. Um, their things have not always been done the right way within the system. But who among the peoples of the world have had the kind of excess production that has been circulated or distributed uh, into other more needful parts of, of the world? Um, uh, that's a part of the prediction that we see here. The, the author, the narrator, presumably Moses, goes on to say, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. And in this we have a metaphor, a picture in a sense, of a vine that, that overspreads and goes beyond. And we've all seen these kinds of things. I think in one sense, although this is not the idea I'm sure that the biblical narrator had in mind, uh, of a, a watermelon vine or a cantaloupe vine uh, out in my father's garden that he, he's grown from year to year over the years. And it, uh, you have to give it lots of space because it overruns and it takes up large stretches of territory. Um, the metaphor here implies the same thing. In your workbook, one of the, the things you're, you're asked to answer is, what does that mean? Well, in many respects, it points us to a time. Actually, you can go back, which we can do right now. It's just in the previous chapter, where it talks about the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh in chapter 48, uh, in verse 16 growing into a multitude in the midst of the earth, becoming so prolific, prolific, so, um, so large in terms of population, that they will spill over the boundaries, uh, the branches, as it were, running over the wall, and become a colonizing people. And that, of course, is in large part the story of the British people as you begin to get into the 17th century, uh, the modern era of, of uh, history. Uh, the 17th and 18th centuries were centuries of great efforts of colonization. And eventually, uh, the, the British people established and founded uh, entire nations, uh, one that broke away, presumably, uh, the, uh, the, the people of uh, principally Manassite descent, and now the United States of America. But there was also the nation state of Canada, uh, South Africa, where the British colonization effort played a very important role for many, many years. Uh, you have as well New Zealand, uh, a colony founded at the encouragement of people like Edward Gibbon Wakefield, who wanted to create and reproduce uh, a, a, another England in a different part of the world. Uh, the continent of Australia, which was ultimately settled for, uh, for reasons originally uh, to replace as a, a dumping ground for uh, criminals, undesirables, and convicts uh, the, in the late 1700s. Uh, the continental North American holdings was used as that region uh, uh, to, to dispense with those undesirables in British society. When the British lost North America as a place to do that, then we find the opening up of the Australian continent. But all of this relates to and ties in and is forecast, in fact, by this verse of Joseph becoming a fruitful bough. Uh, not only economically productive and prolific, but in terms of its demographic trends, in terms of its expansion of population. Uh, you find then that expansion being so great that the peoples, much like the prophecies that we read about today, the prediction to Jacob from God, as uh, in that dream it said that you're going to disperse to the east, you're going to disperse to the west, to the north and the south. Uh, you're going to become a colonizing people. Verse 23, then, the archers have sorely grieved him. They have shot at him and hated him. There have been times in national Israelitish history that things have not gone well militarily for the Israelitish people. Um, uh, they're much along the lines of the story of Joseph. Joseph's life is a pattern. It provides a pattern which predicts the unfolding of the story of his descendants the ups and the downs uh, from, from the prison uh, to ultimately the prime ministership. Uh, the story of Joseph writ large in the history of his descendants reproduces that pattern, not once but numerous times, and we'll, we'll spend uh, the course itself uh, exploring those, those um, uh, fulfillments. Um, but 
verse 24, eventually God comes to the rescue in Joseph's story. It's happened before, it, it is in the process of happening now, and it will happen again. His bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence uh, is the shepherd the stone of Israel. And when you read the story of the history of the Josephite people, the descendants of Israel in modern times, you find the most remarkable developments and events, in some cases nothing bordering on, uh, well, uh, events that can be explained uh, only by uh, miraculous good fortune. Um, God, through intervention, sometimes subtle and sometimes flamboyant and dramatic, has elevated and raised his people to a, a level of world dominance. Verse 25, even by the God of your father who shall help you, and by the Almighty who shall bless you with the blessings. And then you have listed, and we'll spend in future uh, lectures, particularly in part two, a good bit of time developing and, and uh, illustrating how these great economic blessings have made for national greatness among the peoples uh, who are descended from Joseph. This great God, the Almighty, shall bless you with the blessings of heaven above. Remarkable weather conditions. And when you look on the world map at those places and locations where the descendants of the, the, the uh, patriarch Joseph have settled, you're going to find that they've largely concentrated themselves in the temperate zones or zones where the climate lends itself to high agricultural productivity. Uh, if that were not enough, added to this, we find the blessings that lie uh, under. Uh, the natural resources, South Africa perhaps being one of the most dramatic examples, a treasure trove of natural resources, uh, of diamonds, of gold, of, of various metals that are essential for industrial productivity, uh, the oil fields that you find in North America, the North, she North Sea oil, uh, in the early stages and phases of industrialization, both in the United States and in England, the coal reserves that were there lying in store in wait for the moment in time, for the expiration, if you will, of the withholding of the birthright blessings, for those resources to be tapped and drawn and developed and used to propel the English first, but later the American people, to industrial supremacy, which established them as the dominant power presence and peoples of the 19th and 20th centuries. The blessings of the breast and of the womb, population explosion and expansion to the point where the Anglo-American peoples today are one of the dominant uh, nations, not the, uh, certainly not the most numerous, but there as a major presence in the world, uh, nation, uh, our nations looked at as being populous as opposed to small, uh, minor, and insignificant in the scheme of things. Verse 26, and here you find the, the biblical narrator rising to almost a kind of poetic crescendo uh, as we read this. The blessings of your father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bounds of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was. And here again we have something that we've seen in the prophecies stated uh, a little bit earlier. He shall be separate from his brethren. And when you look and reflect on the geographic aspects and elements of where you find the Anglo-American peoples today, you find England, an island kingdom or nation sitting off the coast, uh, the rump as it's sometimes called, of the European continent. And although the English Channel may not be a formidable barrier today, certainly throughout most of the history of, of the British Isles. That channel spared the British people of involvement in many a European conflict. It gave Europe, uh, uh, British politicians the leisure and the ability to choose which conflicts uh, to support, how to support them, or even whether to become involved. Uh, all the more so when you look at the story of the American peoples, separate from their uh, Israelitish brethren, separated by a chasm, a vast 